Good morning, everyone. And a very warm welcome to you to this wonderful service today. The Lord is with us. We share fellowship with him and with those around us. So a very warm welcome to our invited guests on this special day in the life of our congregation. We are glad to welcome Lord and Lady Wallace representing the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, Councillor David Kinneborough and his wife Linda, Penny Johnston and Patricia Stewart from the Lomond and District Fine Arts Society, our friends Margaret Mason, Mabornean Watkins and Marjorie Thomas representing St Mayhew's Roman Catholic Church in the village and we thank Father Maloney for his prayers and good wishes for us today. It is a privilege indeed to have you all with us today in this time of worship. Immediately following the service, we will proceed out to the garden at the side of the church where Catherine Ferguson will unveil the plaque at the tree planted by Archie McIntyre last year to mark our 150th anniversary. Catherine has very kindly agreed to do this in Archie's place, for we were all saddened by his death in January, and I know he would have loved to have been here with all of us today. And after we do that, lunch will be available over in the large hall. There will be a photo exhibition in the small hall today and tomorrow morning of the life of the congregation in years gone by. And as you leave church also today, you will receive a packet of seeds. And this is a way of looking to the future in faith because as we have marked the past 150 years, we want to look to the future. And the seeds are a way of anticipating growth and looking forward to a time of enjoyment when the seeds grow and bloom and bring pleasure. So please take one and receive it with our blessings as you leave church today. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together, whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. Peace be within thy walls, and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say, Peace be within me. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Amen. The choir will now sing the introit. We love the place, O God, wherein thine honour dwells.
let us worship God and sing to his praise and his glory. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. <coughs> Let's take a moment to quieten our hearts and come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, it is good to praise you today. You are worthy of praise and glory, and we know, Lord, that we could never give you enough. For all that you have done for us, and for all that you mean to us, we give you our thanks. 
This, O Lord, is the house of prayer wherein thine honour dwells. Under this roof where generations have found comfort in times of distress, safety in times of trouble, and joy in times of celebration. Here in this place where young and old have been nurtured and fed with the bread of life, it has also been the place wherein your servants meet. We thank you that we can be here today, Lord, part of the unbroken thread of Christian witness. We thank you that our presence is fulfilling a need within ourselves to be near you, that our ears can hear your word speak to us, that our lips can sing praises to you, and that through our prayers we can draw so close to you that we can feel your hand of mercy upon us as we pray for forgiveness. In the week that has passed, we know we have failed you. We have hurt others by our words or actions. Lord, forgive us. Restore us once again to be worthy of your name and calling. Enable us at the start of each new day to honour you with our lives and all that we can offer. As we contemplate the service of generations past, grant us confidence to look forward in faith. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us when we pray, to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. lovely to see some of our young people in church today. It's great to have you with us for this very special occasion and a very special person to share that with us in Lord Wallace, the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. But what we're going to do now is look at a little video that we've compiled and this is going to show some of the ministers going way, way back for me, it's a privilege to be the present day minister, being, being here nearly seven years now, but we're going to look at some photographs of the ministers from long, long ago, going right back to the 1600s, would you believe? Not a photograph of that one, but a painting. <laughs> they were good, but not that good. And also we've got Sheila, who's with us today, and Sheila's going to say in the video a little bit of uh, her reminiscences of Cardra's church. And then we've got some of you, some of the young people who came along yesterday to the garden in the sunshine just to have a wee think about what the church might be like in the future. So some of the names of the previous ministers will be on screen, but we couldn't uh, put all the names on. So let's enjoy.
Hello everyone, I'm Sheila McGowan and I was baptised in this very church in 1934 and since then I have come to the either church services or Sunday school almost every week of my life. There were two churches in Cardiff at that time and that after the Blitz, the children from the parish church came and joined us in our church. Before that, the Sunday school met in the hall adjoining the church, a little hall. So when they came, the, some, some of the classes were held in the church itself. And then after the war, uh, when more uh, houses were built in the village, more children came to the Sunday school. So we needed more room. And on a Sunday, we were given the use of Cardross Primary School, which in these days was on the main road, on the site now used by Cedarwood Court. It was held before the church service, and when it came to the end of the Sunday school, we had to run down the road very quickly to be at the church in time for the service to start. The man who took the Sunday school was called Mr. Birrell. And as well as a house in Cardross, he had a house in Clinder. So in the summer, we went on an outing to Clinder, going on the steamer from Craigendorn Pier to Clinder Pier, neither of which exists anymore. <laughs> but that was quite an expedition in these days. I remember when the new halls were built and the moderator of the General Assembly came to officially open the halls. He stood in the vestibule and knocked on the door of the big hall. <laughs> what a difference it was to have space for all our activities, not just church activities, but village organisations as well. I have been coming to this church building all my life, more or less every week of my life, and uh, I have enjoyed the fellowship. I have felt that the congregation has been more or less my family and uh, I was honoured to serve as the session clerk of this church for 25 years but unfortunately ill health has made, made me uh, retire from that and I'm not able to come to the church so much now because of my health. I, I want to wish the congregation of Carter's Church all the best for the future and hope that for the next 150 years the church here will work as hard as it has done in the last 150 years for the people of Carters. church because everyone's really friendly and it's got a very good minister and we do fun activities at Messy Church and we learn a lot about God. Okay. Well in 150 years time I think the church will have changed quite a lot because 150 years is quite a while away mm -hmm. and I think like, there'll be different people because we'll all be dead. Um, <laughs> So there were different people, like a different generation starting in it. So do you both think it's important? Because you're both a lot, lot younger than I am. So do you think it's important that as you grow older, that you continue to learn more about, about Jesus? Yes, I think it's important. <laughs> yes, yes, I think it is very important. Because Jesus so, is a very, very nice person. Uh -huh. He can take care of the world. He can heal people. Because when we're a grandmother, it's an old lady, we can tell everyone about Jesus and about God and about what we learned at the church. Because the church is a really nice place. I don't think it will change much. I think the way that it does like teach Jesus, Jesus, what Jesus did will still be the same. I think there will be, be a lot of different generation of people there. Um, um, 
I kind of just reminds me that Jesus is always there, like looking out for you, and he won't let anything happen to you that you don't want to happen. The, um, the mission of COVID will be the same in 150 years. Something that's like a, a present, isn't it? Yeah. The, the gift inside will always be. We're, We're looking, looking forward, forward to face. Thank you to all our contributors for that little compilation, just a, a snapshot of the past, the present, and hopefully the future as we go forward in faith as a congregation, as a Christian people in Cardras. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Mod uh, Sheila mentioned that a former moderator opened the new halls across the road in the 50s. Um, and when the church here was built, it was also dedicated on the 14th of January, 1872, by the Reverend Robert Elder, DD, moderator of the General Assembly of the Free Church at that time. So it's a privilege and a pleasure that we have Lord Wallace, the present moderator of the Church of Scotland, with us today for this 150th anniversary. Let's sing together, There is a Redeemer, the message that will go forward into the future that will never change. Let's say our weekly prayer together. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving us your Spirit till your work on earth is done. Amen. We think of all those who worked for the good of this church in years gone by, in these past 150 years, who worked until they were called home to be with their Redeemer. And it's a pleasure today to think of those serving at the moment, and we can recognize their long service today in a very special way. 
So we have some long service certificates to be presented today and it's just wonderful to know that we have people willing to give of their time and their talents and I know how much they do give of these things and have done in the past, continue to do so and will do as the days unfold. So Lord Wallace has agreed to present these certificates today and I ask Maureen Walker and Audrey Foster to come forward and receive these long service certificates in recognition of their wonderful service over the many years here in Cardras. Thank you, Lord Wallace. And we also have one for Sandra McClatchy, but Sandra's unable to be with us today, but we shall make sure that Sandra receives her very shortly. Thank you again, Lord Wallace. And to Audrey and to Maureen, thank you so much for all that you have done and all that you do for the life of our congregation here. We are greatly enriched by everything that you offer to God here. Thank you. And now we have a presentation of a different kind, and I'm going to invite Patty Stewart from LADFAST to come forward because um, something is being presented to the congregation um, by LADFAST, and Patty will explain a little bit about that before she presents it. Thank you. Would you like to go to the lectern, Patty? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It gives, it gives me great pleasure to hand over this copy. There we go, you'll all be able to see it one day, I hope. Um, a record of Cardross Church. The Art Society of Lomond and Argyll is part of a national association of decorative and fine art. Church recording is one of the departments which volunteers sign up for. Our first commission was at Rue Parish Church, followed by St. Michael's and All Angels. Cardross is just the latest one, and we will shortly be starting on St. Monan's in Roseneath. Copies of, all of the records go to the v &A, the National Museum of Scotland, and the County Archives. The record is done to museum standard as requested by the v &A. This is not done overnight. It can take many years. There is a list on page five of the people who took part in this, so I won't name them all here, but suffice to say, that it is a terrific, they did a terrific job, and this is their testimonial. Also, I would like to mention a cushion, I'm not sure where it ended up, that some time ago was designed and worked by Olivia Birch, another of our members. Rue Parish also got a cushion, and St. Michael's got a kneeler, because it was one of the, the textiles things that we did as well. Everyone is welcome to join the Art Society, Loma de Nargyal, if only to come to our monthly lectures. Thank you very much, Reverend. And I will now hand this over officially to you. Thank and you enjoy. very much. I think you've seen it. You think you have seen it. <laughs> thank you very much, Patty. The Reverend said she's already seen it, but anyway, it's a That's lovely meeting. I'm very, thank you. <laughs> I'm very happy to receive this from Patty on behalf of LADFAS. And I know that uh, Penny is also here that was involved in the compilation as was Mrs. Scobie, who is with us today, and the others named in this book. Um, this will be a wonderful record as the years unfold for those who come after us um, to know what was present within the church at the time. It's a snapshot in history of the furnishings of the church building, and it's a wonderful, wonderful piece of work, and I'm happy to receive it, and we look forward to sharing it with everyone in the congregation. Thank you once again.
We come now to God's Word. And our first reading is from the Old Testament, from Micah chapter 6, and then a Gospel reading from Mark chapter 12. And Maureen will read first God's Word for us. Thank you, Maureen. Can I say the ladies of the Guild will probably recognise this reading. What God requires. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Amen, and thanks be to God. Let us share together the words of the first commandment. One of the scribes came near and heard them disrupting with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right teacher, you have truly said that he is one. And besides him, there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that, he answered wisely. He said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. And now let us share words of the widow's offering. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Maureen. Let's sing together how deep the Father's love for us.
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. It is my very real privilege and pleasure to join you today as you celebrate the 150th anniversary of this church building and sanctuary, and to bring to you the warm greetings and congratulations on behalf of the General Assembly. Anniversaries, especially those with a ending with a zero or a five, in our culture seem to have a capacity to fascinate us. I think an anniversary is a bit like a hinge. It's a time for looking back as well as a time for looking forward. So I thought it'd be interesting to ponder on what our forebears might have been thinking about in 1872 when this church was built. The first Education Scotland Act was passed, providing compulsory English language education for all five to 13 year olds in Scotland. There may well have been some local interest in the establishment of Clydebank High School. The Northern Psalter and hymn, book, hymn tune book edited by William Carney was published in Aberdeen containing Jesse Seymour Irvin's setting of Psalm 23, Crimmond. And I just realized, I knew, that, I knew that January was the 150th anniversary. It was only when uh, Maggie said it was the 14th of January that I had noted that on the 14th of January, the Sky Terrier Greyfriars Bobby died. And if you were a football fan, 1872 was a bumper year. The first FIFA recognized international match between Scotland and England took place it was a goalless draw. And that year saw the foundation of Ayr Thistle, Clydesdale, Thirdlanark, Dumbarton, Renton, and a team called Rangers FC. But although this church building was established in 1872 by a free church congregation known as the Burns Church, the records spanning very nearly eight centuries show the presence of the church in this parish of Cardross. And when this church was built, there obviously already existed the pre-disruption Cardross Old Church. And of course, it was that church building which was bombed and destroyed by the Luftwaffe on the night of the 5th of May, 1941. And following that devastating blow, both congregations worshipped here and subsequently became a united congregation. It's very likely, almost certain, that there are people in Cardross today and in the congregation this morning who remember that night 81 years ago this week. And I could not help but think how memories may well have been stirred by the daily news reports over the last two months of buildings destroyed in Ukraine, not least in places like Mariupol and Kharkov. And I called the passage from Luke's Gospel, where Jesus laments over the future of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a mother hen gathers her brood under her wings? And that conveys to me the depth of Jesus' loving tenderness, a tenderness which we pray and we hope will be known today by those sheltering from bombardment. For those who weep today in Ukraine for homes destroyed, for friends and relations dead or wounded, for families who have been separated and are fleeing, and for victims, savage torture. And this morning, as we celebrate 150 years of worship of God in this sanctuary, we remember the faithfulness of those who have preceded us. We reflect on all that has happened here during that time. The thought that in this place, over the last 150 years, children have been brought for baptism, marriage vows have been exchanged, and those who mourn have been comforted. People will have come here to give thanks for joyous occasions in their lives or to seek guidance at a time of anxiety. Familiar metrical psalms will have been sung and on many, many occasions, bread and wine will have been shared. I've no doubt there will be cut records of ministers. Indeed, the record that's just been handed over will record many of them, of ministers, of session clerks and elders who have served faithfully here. People like Sheila McGowan, whose reminiscence both moved and informed us just a moment ago. Of Maureen, of Audrey, of Sandra. People who have served God faithfully in this place. But the witness 
of this church and congregation will also have been greatly enhanced by thousands who have sat here regularly, Sunday by Sunday, faithfully worshipping God, and people who during the week served their Lord and their Saviour in a multitude of different ways. Their names may not feature prominently anywhere, but their witness has also been vital. And they join the many, many ordinary and nameless people whom Jesus encountered in the gospel stories. Today we heard the familiar story of the widow's might, a story just as familiar to us today as it would have been to those who worshipped here in 1872. That widow was as anonymous and nameless then as she is today. But let us reflect for a moment on that widow and on her offering. Her offering was modest, two small copper coins worth a penny. But it provided Jesus with an opportunity to point out to his disciples the real value of her contribution. In Jesus' accounting, the motivation was far more important than the amount. As one American commentator put it, it's not the dollar amount that counts, but the devotion amount. And no doubt, over the years, there will have been significant donors and benefactors to whom the congregation would have been rightly very grateful. But equally, I'm certain that the wealth of witness over the years has been created by the offerings of thousands of ordinary parishioners. Yes, offerings of money in the collection plate, given with devotion, and which will have been well used in the service of Christ's kingdom. But also offerings of talents and offerings of ability. Offerings motivated by love of God and a desire to love your neighbor as yourself. And as we heard, the story of the widow's might comes at the end of the chapter where Jesus is asked, which are the greatest commandments? And Jesus answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Our love for God and our love for our neighbor is our response to God's love for us. As is written in the first letter of John, we love because he first loved us. The widow gives her all, and we are enjoined to give our all, with all our heart, our mind, and soul, which might be said to be our response from within, but also with all our strength, an external or physical manifestation of our love, giving of our time, effort, energy, in prayer or in service to God and to our neighbours. And in responding to Jesus, the scribe affirms the central importance of these commands to love. And in an echo of the words of the prophet Micah, he says that that is more important than to offer animal or other sacrifices. So today, we remember those who over 150 years have faithfully shown their love for God through the devotion of their time, their energy, their efforts in prayer, in worship, and in service. But as I've said, if an anniversary is a hinge, we not only look back, we must also look forward, as the young children did in the video. And we look forward to a future against a backdrop of two years of a pandemic, which has taken away so many of the certainties, and at a time when our church is being challenged to face up to so much change. We are regularly reminded of the challenges facing the Kirk, and in some respects, you've already given a lead through the establishment of the Presbytery of Clyde, because linking north and south of a river isn't always easy. But we still face a stark prospect that 35% of ministers uh, will reach retirement age in the next five years. And insufficient numbers are coming through to replace them. And addressing that reality, last year's General Assembly agreed to reduce the number of ministry posts to 600 plus 60 vacancies by 2025. And the Assembly passed the new Presbytery Mission Plan Act, within which presbyteries must work out the details. And that's the difficult bit. And as I visit congregations in different parts of the country, I'm only too aware that change breeds uncertainty. And that, in turn, can lead to anxiety. So it's important that we're sensitive to an understanding of the concerns of many at this time. But as believers in our Lord, 
Our Lord, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we surely cannot be defeatist. The late President John F. Kennedy once noted that the Chinese word for crisis uses two brushstrokes. One brushstroke stands for danger and the other for opportunity. In a crisis, he said, be aware of the danger, but recognize the opportunity. And the challenge for our church is not only to recognize the opportunity, but to seize it. And I believe that whatever the setbacks of pandemic and lockdown, the good news of the gospel must surely give us a bright hope for tomorrow. Writing in the very early days of lockdown in 2020, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, talked about foundations being laid for whatever new opportunities God has for us on the far side of the crisis. He went on to refer to small actions taken to protect one another, keeping open channels of love, finding new ways of communicating, even simply meditating on how our society might become more just and secure. And we must not let the opportunity slip through our hands as we return to whatever passes for normality. For I have a sense that the pandemic has revealed a spiritual longing in our land. People who previously showed little interest in institutional church life were suddenly logging on to online worship. People who before lockdown may not have known their neighbors were doing acts of kindness for their neighbors, loving their neighbors in very practical ways. Last summer, I read a book by Alan J. Roxburgh with the exceptionally long, challenging, and you might say somewhat ambitious title of Joining God, Remaking Church, and Changing the World. And although it was written sometime before COVID and from a North American perspective, its starting point is that familiar story of declining numbers of aging congregations and of strategy plans which, well, never quite succeed in reversing the trend. But Roxburgh claims we don't live in a world of unbelief. People are yearning to believe in something, but churches can't capture their attention. But far from being downbeat, he believes that the Spirit is disrupting and calling our churches into a new imagination about what it means to follow in the way of Jesus. It is at such a time of change and upheaval that we need to be ready to sense where the Spirit is leading us. I think about the story of the first Pentecost. The disciples were all gathered together in one place when the Spirit descended upon them with wind and flame. But they didn't just stay in the one place. They didn't stay there waiting for people to come in. They went out into the streets, proclaiming the good news of the risen Jesus. And so today, we celebrate a church and congregation, outward-looking, not least in your engagement with young people, a congregation whose suite of halls built with war reparation funding opens its doors to the wider community of Cardross. And as I learned from the Kirk's website that the tower of the old church was retained as a war memorial and duly restored. It was rededicated in 1999 to the glory of God as witness to past faith and future hope. The anniversary hinge of looking back and looking forward in faith. For well, here we have a people of God, inspired by God's love for us in the past, as surely it will in the future. A people whose work and witness is rooted in the knowledge of what the Lord requires of us. To do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Amen. We are grateful to the moderator for his encouraging words for us this morning to set us on our journey for the next 150 years we go in faith. And what better hymn to sing now than, O God of Bethel, by whose hand thy people still are fed, who through this earthly pilgrimage hast all our fathers led.
let's come again in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, Lord of heaven and earth, this is our desire, to walk along the path of life that you have appointed us in steadfastness of faith, in lowliness of heart, in gentleness of love. Let not the cares or duties of this life press on us too heavily, but lighten our burdens, that we may follow your way in quietness, but with boldness in proclaiming mercy and justice. Lord, we do not want to be shallow in our service of you, offering only superficial sacrifices. Help us instead to give sacrificially of our time, talents, and money for the mission of your church in this place and in the wider world. As we give thanks for 150 years of worship in this building, we pray that you will raise up faithful souls to work for the good of this congregation. May there be unity of purpose and strength of spirit to face what lies ahead. Grant to each one of us, regardless of age, a prophet's vision to see what you see, and a pastor's heart to hear the cries of the sorrowful. Today we keep in prayer the people of Ukraine in their time of despair. Be with the bereaved and the dying and those who've lost their homes, livelihoods and loved ones. We pray for other war-torn places in our world where suffering has been a part of life daily for a long time now, even years. Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan. We pray for those bereaved and dying, those ill at home or in hospital, those struggling with life's challenges who are dear to us. And we pray for those at our side, those in front, those behind, and those at home whose needs may be known only to you, Lord. May they come to know your grace and peace for them. We pray for our moderator and his wife as they approach the end of a busy year. We give thanks for their faithful service and ask your blessing upon them and their family as they prepare to hand over the mantle in a few weeks' time. Grant them strength of body, mind and spirit for the future. And as we think of the future, Lord, we want to dedicate our lives once again to you as individual Christians and dedicate the life of this congregation to future generations. That the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which has the power to change lives, may continue to be heard and shared. Fill this church with joy and gladness. Encourage all who attend into a deeper understanding of your love. Bless all office bearers, past, present, and future. For our times, Lord, are in your hands. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all glory, honor, and praise, world without end. Amen. And we sing the hymn written by the late Andrew Scobie, a hymn that has become so special to us here in Cardras. Look forward in faith. So let's go out into the world and do just that. Look forward in faith.
let us go into tomorrow in faith as those who would see not only what the world is but what we can make it be and may our hands our heart our voice be turned towards making it so and may the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit abide with us all now and forever amen <laughs>